Okay, there's a few uh, special areas that we should mention. Now, I did not include the slide in the short form. I think uh, I included it in your, the slide deck which you have. But a, a good example of, of course, what not to do is to uh, look at what, uh, I believe it was the DuPont case, uh, where the planners, so to speak, from the tax department said, you know, it, there's absolutely no downside to just pushing the price as far as we can to maximize how much goes into our Swiss distribution company and how little goes into our manufacturing operation in the United States. Why is there no downside? Well, it's because, gee, there's no penalties for doing this. Now, this is going back a couple of decades. Uh, uh, but uh, there's no penalty for this. Yeah, there's an interest cost if we get caught. But if we get caught, where are we eventually going to come out at? Well, we're not going to be any higher than an arm's length price because the IRS can't tell us to use a higher than arm's length price. So if we push the envelope as much as we can, it doesn't hurt us. So let's just do it. Well, you know, they had this, uh, you know, in memoranda, uh, memoranda that was uh, included, obviously, in the discovery process. And uh, <laughs> it ends up in the, uh, uh, in the court decision itself. And, you know, this is the kind of thing, of course, you probably don't want to see in your client's, uh, client's records. Recognizing that this was happening, uh, Congress at some point said, well, gee, I think we need to provide some serious penalties if you have been so greedy uh, with respect to how you did your transfer pricing. So you see this very large 20% uh, or 40% penalty uh, if you're far enough off on your pricing. The next area, which is a special area that we should talk a little bit about, uh, is uh, cost-sharing arrangements. So the first question is, what is a cost-sharing arrangement? Let's talk about it in the context of a situation where there's a parent and a subsidiary. Uh, the parent has perhaps developed, let's say, some software. The parent has been selling that software. The parent realizes that maybe there's a, uh, a new version or let's say the next generation. And instead of selling that next generation, producing that next generation of software, all by the parent company, which of course is uh, in the US, they say, maybe we'd be better off if we could have that next generation owned at least with respect to sales outside the United States, have that owned by your friendly tax haven company. So the question is if the software is really going to be developed inside the United States and there's going to be sales by P of all of the uh, let's say sales to all U.S. customers and S is going to be making sales to all other customers in the world aside from U.S. customers then we have to somehow jointly develop this new generation. Now there's a lot of interesting things that can come up when we look at this. Uh, number one of course S Let's say it's a newly formed company and has no, no assets at the start. Uh, the first question is, are we really developing, when we develop the next generation, are we really developing something new, or are we developing something that really builds on the existing software, which P owns 100% of the worldwide rights to? So, this becomes a transfer pricing question, which is under that dash four regulation, with respect to whether we need to actually have a sale 
by P2S of the rights to the existing software outside the United States. So that's, that's one aspect. And in that kind of situation, maybe you'd look at it and say, well, gee, uh, this existing generation is toward the end of its useful life. Maybe we could do some income forecasts to figure out what total revenue might there reasonably be over the remaining life of this generation. So we come up with an amount. Now the next question is, now that both, and let's say we come up with an amount and P actually sells to S, either sells or licenses in some way, uh, at least in terms of contractually, so that S now holds the copyright to the existing generation for outside, uh, for future uh, exploitation outside the United States. Now, to develop the next generation, the two of them will have to work together. Now, P, of course, is the one that's employing all of the software engineers who are designing and programming the new generation. S has no employees. S has has no contribution uh, physically to this. Now, of course, it could. S could hire its own team of engineers. S could outsource to a software house in India for, the, uh, for certain responsibilities. But for the sake of at least discussion here, let's assume that they do not do that. So all of the software engineers are up at the P level. If P has sold to S the rights for future exploitation of the first generation outside the United States. Does that necessarily include the right to develop from that software the next generation? Or is that really a different asset? Obviously, it depends on what the initial agreement says. Normally, if, if we're looking, for example, for uh, a comparable transaction between uh, uncontrolled parties of the license, maybe P actually has licensed on a non-exclusive basis, let's say, to various uh, unrelated parties in other countries. And essentially, it does have some sort of comparable license agreement, which might be partly useful in terms of determining what this license should be to S. But those other licenses, of course, are just for generation one. They don't suggest that there's any right to use that generation as the base for further development. If a licensee over here took the, uh, the code and started to develop something on its own, that would be an infringement uh, normally you'd expect. So in any case, what I'm trying to at least suggest here is that you've got to break up what is being transferred into pieces and value each piece. So one piece is uh, the future exploitation of the first generation. And the second is the right to use the code from the first generation to develop the second generation. P now owns just the rights, uh, looking at the next generation, the rights to develop something for exploitation in the United States. S has the same, uh, let's say, basic package but only for exploitation outside the United States. They're not going to independently develop it, although legally they could. Rather, they're going to decide, gee, we should get together. We should mutually bear the cost of this further software development. So the concept of a uh, CSA, cost-sharing agreement, is this specific situation. Now, there's 
just pages and pages and pages and pages in uh, 1.482-7 regarding cost sharing agreements. If you're interested in it, by all means, you know, I encourage you to, to read through those things. Uh, but the concept is what you want to take away. That, number one, this is for mutual development of intangibles. Mutual development of intangibles. Secondly, that the subsidiary, or at least the company which is, uh, in your mind, maybe getting the benefit of ownership of this, uh, of this intangible, has to pay what you'd call a buy-in cost to get it economically level with the other party. So that both parties have, in a sense, an equal ability to develop and exploit what is their right. Now, we've talked a number of times about how Congress doesn't want to let any value escape the U.S. tax system. So the point is that that buy-in has to be at arm's length. You've got, the again, the Dash 4 rules. And further, to the extent that P is bringing capabilities to the table, in other words, it's got this fund of uh, of software engineers, this cadre of software engineers who are already knowledgeable, already trained, already know the product, already already there. That, in a sense, is an asset. And there needs to be a buy-in, which is referred to as a platform contribution under the regulation. There needs to be a buy-in where S pays for that. So that itself becomes a a transfer pricing question. So let's say we, yes, uh, Peter. So that's separate and apart from the license, right? The buy-in? Well, it, it obviously it depends on uh, how the original license for the first generation outside of the United States is structured. You could write all of these things into that, uh, but I think uh, uh, maybe more often uh, these things are dealt with separately, but it could be either way. Okay, so let's say we've gone through this first this first stage of how uh, S has been brought up to the level, so to speak, of P, so that both of them now own what they are supposed to own. Okay, now they enter into this cost sharing agreement, and they have to split the costs. Well, the obvious question is, how do you split the costs? Maybe the estimated cost at the start of this thing is $5 million from the beginning to the end of the development and when it's ready for marketing. How are you going to split that $5 million? Or whatever in actuality it comes out to be, because maybe it'll be $4 million, maybe it will, will be $6 million. But how do you split it? The concept is the parties have to think about what their reasonably anticipated benefits are. So that means coming up with some forecasts of how big is the U.S. market, how big is the non-U.S. market, and come up with some calculation that says, okay, the U.S. side is going to contribute 45% and the foreign side 55% reasonably anticipated benefits. An obvious additional issue is, well, gee, what costs go into the pool which is then split 45-55? What are the costs? And there's a bunch of regulations on that. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we get into the, uh, the supply chain structure discussion. But this ability to have cost-sharing agreements is something, is, is uh, let's say, a very, very important mechanism to supply chain planning and the ability that multinationals have to build up these billions and billions of dollars in low-tax foreign income. This ability to take seriously 
that one group that is all 100% commonly owned and controlled can create the legal fiction that one member of the group owns this, another member of the group owns that, and we take it seriously for tax purposes. And then we further take it seriously by having each side pay for its share and own outright its share with no need for royalties, future royalties between parties, because each one owns its share. You need to be able to divide this. In other words, here I'm referring to P having all of the U.S. rights as far as exploitation is concerned, and S having the rights everywhere in the world, with the exception of the U.S. In other words, there's an identifiable way to look at them and have, them have the rights so they do not overlap. The rights do not overlap. Is geography the only way that uh, we might break this up? Are there perhaps other ways we could break this up if it were appropriate for the industry or the, uh, the companies involved? Fields. Fields. Okay, good. Uh, uh, the fact that a maybe uh, a certain technology is used in power generation and also in certain electrical appliances which are manufactured. So you could break it up, yes, by field, exploitation in the power generation industry versus exploitation in the electrical appliance manufacture and sale uh, industry. <coughs> what it's meant to achieve is to prevent P from shifting to S uh, value which already exists. Well, the, the P should be compensated for. Prevent P from shifting uh, value which it should be compensated for. See, what's, you know, I, I, I uh, harp on this from the standpoint that, you know, we have one group, all 100% owned, and it's totally artificial that we say, gee, we're going to sell, you know, we're going to take, uh, you know, part of this and we're going to put it in our other pocket. Uh, that's artificial, economically. But our, the environment we're in allows those things to be taken seriously. So, yes, P can carve up what it owns and shift part of it to a related company. All the pricing rules are saying is, whatever that value is, it better be paid for. Well, isn't there an argument that since they're all related, aren't they just one owner? And there wasn't really a sale. There wasn't really a transaction. To... Now, I, I, I talk about this more in the next course, but here in the United States, where most large companies and many, many small companies as well file consolidated federal tax returns, things get pretty sloppy as to who owns what. But where you have a U.S. company versus a non-U.S. company, which is part of the same group, the non-U.S. company is not included in the U.S. consolidation. The U.S. tax authorities, the courts, our system holds that that subsidiary is a separate legal person. It's a fiction. It really is a fiction. But that's the reality within which we operate. Yes, Glenn? Along those lines, uh, the software engineers could actually report into this foreign subsidiary. Is that correct? Well, we could certainly, yes, if it made sense, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, have those software engineers employed by the subsidiary. Now, probably we don't want to do that unless those software engineers also want to go and live in Bermuda or the Cayman Islands. Now, maybe they like it on the beach and they can do their job just as well on the beach. But we probably don't want them remaining in the U.S. and being employees of the company because now we have a U.S. trader business and we have all the complications and issues that 
that that uh, creates. Now, having a firm understanding of this fiction in which we operate, that a group may be totally, you know, 100 percent uh, group, no minority interests at all, but legally we respect the legal entities. Now, again, I think we talked at some point before, you know, if you really don't respect the existence of a specific legal entity, you don't do the corporate niceties, then uh, yeah, maybe it could be called a sham and uh, ignored. Or if you act in a manner where that company is really just acting as an agent for another company. But if you dot your I's and cross your T's, generally these things are respected. 